Okay, so uh, right now, uh, Deborah Bradley Kramer from Columbia University. She is uh, she is there a musicologist, a specialist on Russian music. She is teaching there. She is a professor there for many years. She uh, actually volunteered. She said, "Would the students here be interested in hearing about uh, Russian music and Russian poetry?" In connection, this is I think that would be great, and so Deborah is preparing, uh, she has prepared a wonderful, wonderful presentation for you to listen, to enjoy some of the poems that you read, you actually will hear now, as represented by music, and uh, let's welcome Deborah. She also, she also prepared the poems in both English, Russian, and with notes about the music. Thanks, so she will distribute and uh, can we give one copy right away to So, yes, thank you. Um, that's about the best I can do right now. It's been many years since I studied Russian here at NYU with. Um, oh, yes, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I forgot a crucial thing. And if I speak badly, it's not because, not a reflection on uh, Professor Villagetas, because I haven't. But I do understand still, and I was very moved by your recitation of the poetry, and it was, it was, it was, really, it's inspired me to like resume studies again. I think because it's, it's, it's really wonderful, and um, I, um, I. I I teach at Columbia, I teach in the Department of Music now for about 17 years, and I specialize, I'm a pianist also, and I kind of specialized in, specialize in Russian music, and, um, and I'm teaching a course in Russian music right now, and my students came to, um, to, to visit as well at NYU, and um, I want to pass this out, this is not, um, this is not uh, really a, a talk for musicians, it's a talk for Anyone who um, loves poetry and loves music, and I'm curious though, is anybody a musician in here, or read music, or connected with music? Probably quite a few, right? Um, I uh, yes, there was yeah, one. Here. I saw no, I saw there were, there were quite a few people. Um, make sure everybody gets this first, and we only have three, probably three and a half songs, very short, that we're going to listen to. I know there, there isn't much time, and. I want to focus on a few aspects of these um, these songs and, and the poetry, and and start by really asking um, the question: Is why put music to poetry after all? I mean, the way you read these poems um, sounded so musical, and the music is already inherent in the poem, and it's there, and the rhythm, and the flow, and the lyricism is there. And so, why put music after all? Um, and some say it should stand alone. In other words, the poem should not have music; it should just be as it is. And um, others believe that it really should and can have music and then be enhanced by the music. Um, and whatever your point of view about that, though, music greatly changes the way we receive the poem and the way it comes to us, based on the composer, of course, and based on the performer's rendition of it and the instrument that accompanies, which often is the piano. So um, interestingly, of 500, um, of, of 5,000, um, of, well, there are 3,000 works that I know of, not each one personally, but there are 3,000 works of Pushkin set to music. And that doesn't count the operas um, that we probably know we're talking about in you know, poem settings uh, for voice and piano. Um, so the question is really why was Pushkin's music set to music, um, so much, his poetry set to music so often? And there are a few reasons. Um, one, of course, as you all know, having studied so much of it, is the freshness and novelty of the language and the, the um, unusual turns of phrases and expressions that make this really appealing and challenging for composers. And also some of the ambiguities of the words and phrases that also lend another aspect of challenge to a composer's um, abstract palette, you know, how to create this kind of ambiguity in the music, or to go against it, which they sometimes do as well. And the subject matter, of course, too, the vividness of the fairy tales and the, the images and the very, very vivid, um, um, brightly etched images that we have in, in Pushkin's poetry so much that you all well know um, as well. So in, in the Renaissance in Western art music, um, we have something called word painting when we have a poem set to music, as some of you might know if you've studied music history. And really it's a fancy way, or the other one is a fancy way of saying it's an onomatopoeic device. 
So we have a phrase or a word that is mimicked in the music. So I want to show you an example, um, and this this is the um, the lines three and four of your the last poem here, which, is, which begins with um, Yeah, the last one I remember is wonderful moment, and it's lines um, three and four. And I just want to illustrate for those who may not be familiar with how word painting works with um, text, um, how it can be rendered in a in a song. So let's listen to these lines um, three and four and see how the music illustrates these you know, flying years as discussed and then as contrasted in the next line, you know, the remoteness and the isolation and how that plays out um, musically. So starting from that line. It could be in opposition to the words at a time when you know it might seem quite surprising. So, for example, um, you uh, the the next one, the next um, poem I want to show you that um, starts with with spring and uh, the words that begin with spring, spring, and it's on number it's actually the first one on your copy on your page. And um, of course, if you don't look ahead and you look at only the first two lines. Um, you might imagine that it could be a very, you know, optimistic and bright sounding song, um, but quite the opposite is the case. So let's listen to the open, uh, opening of this, and first also listen to both the quality of the voice vis-a-vis uh, -vis the words, listen to the instrument choice and what the instrument is doing vis-a-vis -vis the words, and just listen how, um, how, think about whether the two go together, first two lines only. So just from the beginning to like 23. So I want you to listen to how the clarinet <coughs> asserts a separate voice um, against the words, and notice also on the line eight, uh, on li lines five, sorry, 
On line five, when we're talking about pleasure here, watch what the clarinet, how the clarinet mirrors or doesn't mirror this line five. And then when we get to lines, um, line eight, listen really carefully for this word painting and what happens on, on um, the word metel and uh, you know, storm and tempest. And when these words are, are um, said, what is, the, um, what is the composer wanting you to feel on these words and how is it rendered musically? So um, I want you to, uh, let's just hear the whole, let's hear this, this song. It's quite short, mm -hmm. two minutes, yeah, from the beginning. makes a very abstract, out of time, completely off the beat, completely in another dimension statement, two times. So it's completely out of you know, the universe, um, this woodblock. What time is it marking? So it's just 112, one little snippet of, of that. Listen to the woodblock. <laughs> Shostakovich's last um, compositions at you know, a very um, difficult time in his life, uh, as many times were in his life. And it's quite a, a fascinating, I think, um, um, rendition of this, of this text. So I want to just quickly um, uh, say a, a couple of things um, for the next two songs I want to show you in terms of music and how music works within a poem. Three, quick, three very easy categories. Of course, rhythm, we all know what that is meter, um, fast, slow, adding a completely different meaning to a, to a poem if it is super fast or super slow, just like a symphony uh, conducted by one conductor can mean something completely different if it's in a very slow, languid tempo versus a super fast one. Same with, um, with these settings. And um, uh, melody, of course, we all know, you know, some melodies can sound minor, major, 
sad, happy, for lack of a better way of, of, of saying it. But also, melodies in text and in poem settings are fascinating too because they can suggest memory. Um, a melody might occur with certain text and then go away, and then on another part of the song, you hear that melody, and you therefore think kind of on a second layer. You're hearing a text, but you're also hearing a melody, which means something else from the past. Does that make sense? Kind of reminiscent. So it works with memory also in a very fragmented way, almost sometimes a postmodern way in, in terms of the setting, if you want to think of it that way. And finally, the phrases, as we just heard. That one did not end as we thought it would, so it leaves us in this sense of suspension. So let's let's go to um, this one we have, just um, this this one I would like to hear, to play for you, um, because this one, um, I think the piano, I want you to notice one very Russian thing in the, in the piano, and it's called an ostinato, and all that is is a fancy word for a repetitive figure pattern that usually happens in the bass. It goes back to the Middle Ages. Um, medieval music, we have um, Baroque music, we have ostinato. And this, um, we could have a long conversation about ostinato in Russian music, but in short, in uh, the 19th century, a lot of ostinato was used when Russia was trying to define itself nationally through music to kind of go against the Western canon, Western European canon of goal-oriented processes, always kind of leading to resolution of the tonic. Instead, we had this kind of weird, haunting, kind of repetitive, non-developmental thing going on. So it suggests inertia, and it also suggests, you know, uh, Russian music. So we've got a lot of um, Russian aspects in the music. So let's hear just the beginning of this, just um, till five seconds, just to show what the ostinato is, just in the piano accompaniment. So. That's it. Just, so that's just a repetitive kind of plodding bass and called an ostinato. And uh, I want to, to play just um, uh, this, this one line at 24 just to show you um, something how something about how the piano tries to come. actually no let's play just the whole thing because of the time let's it's short and I want you to listen for uh, line three especially on this uh, the desire one how the um, the piano tries to assert a voice that is kind of more energetic or hopeful sort of going against what the words say and then Interestingly, dissonance, meaning harshness, happening on line eight with the word that should be, um, one would think, you know, a happy word. So again, the music going against what the text is and adding another kind of an ambiguous aspect to it. So let's just hear this in, in, in its entirety. It's only um, also two and a half minutes long. So, um, desire. <laughs> Thank you. 
so you know, it, it, it's interesting how on one word you can have a dual meaning because the music presents two sides of one particular chord, like a dissonant going into a consonant chord. How much time do we have? Like ten minutes? It's okay. Okay. So I have two two more um, things I want to show. These are two. I think some of the two the really interesting ones musically. Um, a little more bright. Well, none of them are really optimistic. I have to say. I don't feel like there's sort of a pall in them. But we know about that. I mean, Russian poetry has a lot of those. Um, so this one is really fascinating um, song, um, musically speaking, because it has. Um, hints of folk music in it, which of course you will hear very quickly with the balalaika, um, which is used, um, written by Shiremietiev, who is the same Shiremietiev of the history of um, you know, the serf Shiremietiev family. Um, not a well-known composer in his own right, but um, um, a very interesting one in the song. And there's a huge contrast here between the voice and the light instrument. It's a really fascinating uh, dichotomy between and um, the instrument really gives its own character. And what I want you to listen for here is our silences. And some of you did that really beautifully when you were reading the poems. You know, some of you had these, like, not just line stops, but like, really effective and very wonderful silences that lent a lot of meaning to what went before and with what came after. And in music, too, you know, this is a really important device in the, in the poem rendition. So um, I want you, let's just listen to this, and um, I'd love for you to um, hear how, how strangely you know, this um, combination manifests between the balalaika, the folk character, and the, um, the, um, the poem's meaning itself. And I would like you also to listen for one thing, um, these long, drawn-out syllables that we have sometimes. Um, we have, you know, operatic almost in, in some places where you have certain words that are drawn out for a really long time. We can't, we can do that a little bit in reading or reciting poetry, but not, you know, for uh, several seconds holding one syllable, you know, or holding one word as we can in music with the accompaniment. <coughs> so um, let's uh, listen to this. The balalaika.
so apparently, um, obviously, Soviet era singer whose career um, it was really well known. And I mean, I discovered him for the first time this year. So this is the last song I want to play for you. And do um, you like that? Do you like any of them? I think it looks like his voice is so much like a Russian, you know, Orthodox choir. You know, the the low profundo. It's just so expressive, and it's so. Usually when you have bass singers, they don't have such a velvety tone like that. It's, it's almost, it's just, I sense chills, it's gorgeous. <coughs> so the last one, well known, I'm sure you, I mean, you heard it, and you, you know this one very well. And this one is kind of, um, it is, is a favorite uh, rendition of it of mine, in part because it illustrates orientalist elements in the, um, in the music. And um, we know probably something about how Russia, um, Russian musicians, composers, um, incorporated, one could say sometimes appropriated, some orientalist elements into their music in order to suggest folk tunes from the distant areas, um, the eastern territories. And some of that, some of those were, um, there were certain turns of phrases, I'm going to show you one, there was a lot of ornamentation, they were very stereotypical things which were not truly authentic. Um, so there was, you know, quite a bit, there was criticism for the way some of them did it, but all Russians recognized the tropes that they used, um, and we recognize them too, probably in this. Um, a lot of ornamentation and a certain, um, a certain uh, interval, which I want to show you, which, which is very easy to hear, I think, and the ostinato, once again, coming back to, um, to that, which indicates um, in many cases, a sort of non-Western, again, you know, goal-oriented um, type of a piece, which is in the style more of Beethoven, Mozart, the German tradition that many um, of us in the West grew up listening to. So, um, and again, silence here plays a really important role. And um, <clears throat> um, I want to I want to show again just a quick ostinato here. Just for a second, you probably know what this is like already, but. easy just to hear something repeating and repeating. That's the astonato. And then the oriental sounding scale, um, one, in other words, a scale or a, sorry, an interval rather, that is used often in Russian music to suggest the Far East or um, music um, which is written on that subject uh, is this 128. Right. Right. That little turn. Augmented second, so you know that. So that is, um, is it really oriental? That's another whole discussion. But it's used in many, many pieces that Russians call, you know, uh, that Russians name after certain um, oriental images, um, oriental images and stories. So um, and then finally, and I'll have you just listen to this as it goes. There's a suggestion of chant-like element in the music too. And in chant, simply it is often re repeated notes on one note or just very tiny intervals, no big skips in the melody. So let's, let's listen to this and hear how we have this wonderful combination of folkish, Russian Orthodox suggestion in the chant a little bit, and also the Orientalist, um, Oriental aspects.
Thank you very much. 